programme, presented by Hannah Murray. Joining me on the line now from the States is Randy Schmidt. He's a music teacher and compiled and edited yesterday once more Memories of the Carpenters and Their Music. He's also served as creative consultant for several television documentaries on the Carpenters. He's got a new book out. It's called Little Girl Blue. It's an intimate profile of Karen Carpenter and it was selected recently as Book of the Week in the Daily Mail. Welcome to the book show, Randy. It's a pleasure to visit with you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. And um, is it fair to say that you're a fan of the Carpenters? Oh, definitely, yes. I, I fell in love with Karen's voice at basically first here when I was um, about 13 years old. And um, there, there was never another, or there hasn't been another connection for me like that with any other voice or any other singer. She just had a way of of singing straight to me and I felt like you know she was speaking to me through her through her voice. Do you think in a, in a way a lot of people felt like that about her? I, I do think that it's it's kind of a common thread among Carpenter's fans and she had this unique ability to to communicate in such a way that that people felt that you know she was singing only for them and I think that's that's something that a lot of singers don't necessarily accomplish. She, mm. she was had such a personal quality to her tone and 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 just sort of bared her soul to the listener. Because people talk about the fact that it was her brother Richard that was the the dominant musical force, but as you say, she was the one that the public seemed to adore. Yeah, you know, Richard was the the trained musician from from a very early age and and showed musical talent from you know the age of two or three. Karen was sort of a the musical surprise or <laughs> the musical accident in the family. Nobody mm -hmm. knew she could do anything until she was sixteen or seventeen years old, and it was just a natural talent and her her love for first of all the drums before singing. Yeah, I was going to say she was playing the drums for a while before she started to sing, wasn't she? Yes, and you know, as as fine as a singer as she became, she always considered herself a drummer first and foremost. That was her primary instrument. It wasn't the voice. Um, I, I think that 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 shows you know that she was was a great musician even even outside of the, being a vocalist. And very very unique. You don't get that many female drummers, do you? No, and to be able to play and sing at the same time, you know, to play is, is to play well is one thing, and then to sing well is another. But to put them together and for it to be so effortless, she was just really amazing to watch. You see the videos and you think, how could she keep it all together and in, in time? And and it was just it was flawless. Mm. So, looking at their big break, how and when did all that happen? They had um, played around the, the music scene in, in L.A. for a couple of years and had done several different variations of, of, a, of groups, starting with the jazz trio. And um, the jazz trio sort of morphed into a vocal group, and that vocal group became frustrated and discouraged after you know a year or so of trying to get a record deal and performing at places around around town and they disbanded but Karen and Richard continued recording that big vocal sound and they they started overdubbing those vocals themselves and um the result was was something that people really hadn't heard you know, it had been done back in the in the in the fifties by people like Les Paul and Mary Ford and Patty Page had done some of that overdub sound, but it was really sort of new to the to the radio audiences in the seventies. And their style as well, and the kind of things that they sung about or didn't sing about, again was very different to a lot of the more raunchier things that were happening in the seventies. You know, they never sung about drugs or sex or anything like that, and and always changed the lyrics. If they were given a song that mentioned things like that, they'd change it so it, it wasn't in there, or didn't they? One of their one of their earlier hits was Superstar, which a lot of people don't recognize from the from the title, but it's the, the chorus was the Don't you remember you told me you love me, baby. There was a line in there that said, I can hardly wait to sleep with you again. And they they changed it to hardly wait to be with you again. But, you know, the Carpenters fans were a certain breed. At the time, you know, that they did a song, Goodbye to Love, there was a, a kind of a fuzz guitar solo at the end of it. And they received 
hate mail from a lot of their fans that thought that they'd kind of sold out to this rock and roll sound. So I can't even imagine what would have happened if they had left, you know, the words sleep with you <laughs> in a song at the time. Because they had a lot of coaching from publicists, didn't they, who really told them what to say and what not to say in interviews and that kind of thing. Yeah, the book actually mentions um, there was a radio guy in Chicago that was interviewing them, and he was getting all these you know, really honest responses from them. And this was pretty early on in their career. And he said that he could see their publicist through the glass, you know, just freaking out, trying to stop them. And and after that point, they were kind of coached in, this is what you say, and this is how you say it. You don't get into religion and politics and all of these places that he was leading them. And so after that, I think the answers became a little more prescribed for them. Mm -hmm. And obviously, most people will know the the very sad and tragic ending of Karen Carpenter's life, dying of a heart attack at a very young age of 32. Uh, what, What went wrong, do you think? You know, it's it's hard to to pinpoint, you know, just one or two things that that you could say this is what went wrong. But around 1975, um, when Karen was about 25, she began to show, you know, the outward signs that something was definitely not going right on the inside. And I, there was a strained relationship with her mother, and a lot of people, I think, could point to that as kind of the catalyst for what for what happened with Karen. Um, And in that situation, from the time she was a little girl, Karen kind of felt second best to to Richard. Richard was the one who was planned to be the the star. They they even moved, you know, across the country for Richard to become a superstar. If they put him closer to California and the Hollywood and that whole music scene, they thought that you know he had a better chance. And Karen was sort of the afterthought in all of this. And she she knew her place in the family, I was told by several people. She knew her place in the family and where her rank was and, and where she kind of fell in line as far as um, her ranking in the family, and that she was okay with that. But I, I, I don't think inside she was. You know, when a parent favors one over the other, I think it, over time it, it definitely starts to wear the other down, and they try to... Um, you know, outperform and outshine and, 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 and do more to get their parents' attention. Well, one way Karen got attention was the weight loss. That was one thing in her life that she could control. Mm. She had a record company who was controlling things and, um, you know, a family who, who had so much control and shelter around her. But that, that weight was, was one way that she could control things. And a friend of, a good friend of Karen's, actually her best friend, who was her matron of honor at her wedding, told me that she felt that the anorexia was a direct result of the fact that you know there was a hole she said in Karen's heart of course not physically but but emotionally there was a hole in her heart where the love of a mother should have been and it wasn't there and she said we tried so hard as her friends to to fill it and she said but it couldn't have been filled by the friends it couldn't have been filled by a successful marriage or you know, even the love of adoring fans, millions around the world, that place was where she wanted, you know, to know that her mother loved her and to be told that and to feel that. And it just, it wasn't there. That's very sad. Um, I know at her worst, uh, her weight went down to under under six stone, five stone, eight pounds she went down to. D- did she know that she had a problem with anorexia, do you think? Was she aware that she was really quite ill? In hindsight, you know, she wasn't admitting to people for, for quite a long time, but she was reaching out to people all along through through that time. And um, we know now that she contacted um, several people in the late 1970s, people that she felt, you know, had either um, struggled with the same situation. And there was a lady named Cherry Boone, who was Pat Boone's daughter. And she had had kind of a public issue with with anorexia, and had um, Karen found out that she was writing a book about her struggles, and that she had she had come out of them, she had recovered, she was getting married, and and it seemed to have the perfect life after an eating disorder. And Karen contacted her in the late mid to late um, 1970s, so she was reaching out, and you know she was reading books and things like that. But she didn't admit to anybody really that she had a problem until 1981, and this was after her marriage began to fail. She said, "You know, I realize I have a problem. I realize I'm sick," and that was when she 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 made a move to to New York. She wanted to to get into a therapy program there that um, that she heard that she'd heard about and that was kind of the the start of her attempt to get to get well 
what do you know why why she didn't get well then what what happened with that i think that, that the problem was is that she had kind of set a deadline for herself you know that she was going to put this much time into getting well she was going to spend a year in new york and i think that she thought that everything would be fine and it, it seems as though she really didn't commit fully enough. You know, it was coming close to that, that year point. It was November after her having moved there in January. It was the following November, and she was ready to check herself out and head back home in time for Thanksgiving. You know, it, it was something that she probably would have needed to devote at least two or three, maybe four years of her life, and it's not something that could just be done overnight. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I think she checked out prematurely and thought that she would be fine, that she was on the road to recovery. But in fact, she had done enough damage prior to that that her heart was just unable to take the, the, the stress. Looking at the, the book and the process of putting the book together, um, was it enjoyable? I mean, do you enjoy doing all the research for a book like this? Very much. You know, it, it, was, a, it was a sad book in many ways. Um, you know, the things I was finding out, um, of course, in the title, hints to that. Um, but overall, just working with Karen's story and her legacy and being associated with somebody who's, who was such a fine person and such a great talent, it was a true pleasure to work on and, and to be associated with. It must have been absolutely fascinating meeting her family and friends as well and chatting to them. Yes, and then hearing from them later on, you know, after they had seen the book completed, hearing back from them saying, you know, you really captured the person that we remember. And that was that was my goal. I wanted to bring her into sort of a three-dimensional person because before this point, we had had a very strict, almost press release version of Karen, what the record company wanted us to know, what the family wanted us to know. And this was the first time that I had really, or that anyone had really went beyond that and went beneath that. And we weren't under that editorial control of the family or the record company. Obviously, we want people to get the book, but can you give us an example? Can you give us a, a taste of something that you found out that you were really quite shocked to learn maybe about her? I think the details of Karen's marriage. You know, a lot of people don't even realize that she was married, but they were together for about a year of her life. And shortly after, she completed a solo record in New York, she came back home to, to L.A., and the album ended up being shelved. It was, it was very poorly received from the record company and from the family, mainly, I think, because everyone was a little afraid of Karen Carpenter going solo and you know, being no more Carpenters. But she was really devastated by the response to this, and around that time met a man and fell head over heels in love, and it was, as they say, a whirlwind romance. Within a couple of months, they were engaged, and I think that she felt so out of control with losing you know, control of that solo album that she wanted to take control in some other way of her life. So she, she got married and she thought, okay, this is a way I can grow up and take control of my life. And that turned out to be one disaster on top of another. And unfortunately, I think that the, the marriage and, and the, the failure of the marriage turned out to be one of the final, as they say, nails in the coffin. Yeah. And that was one area that because Richard Carpenter has a, an agreement with with the ex-husband, they hadn't been able to talk about it in other books. And so this was really the first time that I think people are able to see kind of what went on during, the, during that year that they were together. And thanks to Karen's friends coming together and saying, we want the real story told, and that was done. That's amazing. So they had an agreement that they weren't going to, to share any of that information, the brother and the ex-husband? Yes, after, after Karen's death, I don't know if it was initiated by Richard Carpenter or the Carpenter family, but basically they agreed not to speak about the other. Tom Burris, who was Karen's husband, agreed not to speak of the Carpenter family or his relationship with Karen in exchange for the Carpenters not talking about, hmm. about him in return. It's been this closely guarded secret as to really what went on during that year of, of marriage. And it took, as I said, those probably four or five really close girlfriends of Karen's who, who came forward near the end of my research and said, you know, we, uh, we realize you're doing this and we're ready to, to tell our side of the story. And it was it was those ladies who really brought a lot of depth, I think, into the story. 
Fantastic. Well, well done you. You've got uh, you've got some details out there that haven't been out there before, so that's great. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, Randy, thanks ever so much for joining us. Randy Schmidt, if listeners want to find out more information about you and your book, they can have a look on the website. It's www.karencarpenterbiography.com and they can get a copy of the book. We'll be putting it up on our website very shortly in the bookshop section. It's called Little Girl Blue and it's a biography of Karen Carpenter. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you.